Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the eighth edition of the Cover It Live University web series. My name is Spencer Kitley. I'm the event specialist here with Cover It Live. And as we get started, I want to ask everyone to please mute your telephones or mute your computer microphones uh, during this webinar. We appreciate you joining us today for the latest webinar, and we look forward to sharing with you some important tips on how to better use the event studio's media library, live scoreboards, polls, and, and a whole lot more. Before we get started, I want to provide you with a brief overview of the format of today's Cover It Live University. We expect the webinar to last between 20 and 30 minutes. As conclusion, we'll open the floor for you to ask questions through the WebEx uh, chat window. Additionally, if you have questions during the, the webinar, you can submit those through the WebEx chat window, and members of our staff will get back to you uh, live during the chat. Tomorrow, this webinar will be posted on the web where you can view it or share it with your colleagues. Um, you'll receive an email from us when it is available. So I ask once again if you please mute your phones, mute your microphones on your computers as we get started. And now I'd like to introduce the host of today's webinar, the General Manager of Cover It Live, Ben Schneider. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, as Spencer mentioned today, we're going to go over some of the tips for using the new event studio. And in this, we'll focus on uh, media and interactive elements in particular. In the past few weeks, we focused on, in the recent uh, Covert Live University series, we focused on some of the functionality around uh, leveraging Twitter and some of the other social capabilities, engaging your audience with content from those sources, as well as managing large audiences and using some of those tools. And today, we'll focus on some of the interactive pieces, such as the media library, uh, the live score automation for if you're running a sporting event or even some other event where tallying the score would be useful, um, as well as engaging readers with polls, trivia, and using the news flash for persistent content or even monetization options. So if we jump into these topics, we'll do a quick overview and then I'll demo uh, some of the features of the event studio and how you can use these to better your events. First, we'll start with the media library. So the media library is a great tool that you have access to during your live event that allows you to pull in video, photo, and other types of content, even text content, and, and other things that you have set up before the event, or the ability to add that sort of media content directly to the event right away. Uh, there's also the ability before the event is even started for you to go set up and configure a lot of this content and then use it and share it across multiple events. So the media library has a lot of robust functionality, including the ability to preload, the ability to upload instantly into the event while it is live, and to manage the content um, whether it's images, whether it's video, or whether it's text and other forms of content. Well, yeah, this video has also added some features that make it really, really easy and convenient whenever finding that content, editing it, and pulling it in, um, and very, very quickly and efficiently. So, with that, we'll jump in and look a little bit of the media library. So right here I've gotten uh, the event studio already pulled up for an event that I am running for our CILU demo event and our demo ticker that we've often used throughout the Covert Live University series. So I've got a content running, I've got some Twitter content coming in and comments that are getting uh, added to the system and so on. But at this point now I want to I add a photo. Well, there's a number of different options to do this. The first one we'll start with is the quickest. I know that I have a photo already saved to my machine right now, and I just realized very quickly that it's a great opportunity to drop that in, and I want to add it. Well, with the event studio, you now have the ability to drag and drop photos directly into the event very quickly. So I've got a folder open on my desktop that has some photos in it. I can simply drag those into the writer's area, and then the photo will get uploaded, and I can see a progress bar around that, and then it's added to the event. That is the quickest and easiest way to, to get media content, whether it's photos or whether it's video, et cetera, uploaded directly and quickly to the event without having to get even stuff into the media library or any of the other ways that you can pull in that, that sort of content. Even once it's published, let's say that I want to add a caption or want to make some adjustments, and I can do that. I can click Edit from within the live content stream and add a caption for the event. And then save that, and then it's automatically updated across the live events and across all of my viewers who are looking at it. This uh, option is also available very quickly through just a simple upload button. So if, for example, I've got my event studio maximized to the full screen, I need to see everything going on, I'm looking at the smart stream, I have some comments and some Twitter configuration or other things that are happening, uh, and I don't have the option to drag and drop, then I can click the Add Event Media button. And similarly, very quickly, find it on my machine, and then add it to the add it to the live event. Once again, I can edit it or make adjustments once the content is uploaded if I need to, and this provides me the shortest, quickest path to getting that content added to the event. 
So, for example, if I know that I've had content um, or photos, images, even text content that I uploaded beforehand, and I want to introduce at different times in the event, maybe I'm covering a sporting event and I have images of players, or maybe it's a news event, and I want to introduce some pictures that the staff has added around, um, you know, maybe it's a weather event or something like that, and I've got those available in my media library, and I can also access those very quickly from within the event studio. All I have to do is click on the media button within the toolbar, and I'll see my full media library here. And you'll notice that the media library includes not only images and videos, but other forms of content as well, including audio, or content that I've designated as an advertisement, or even links that I've set up before the event, or pre-written text content that I want to publish to the event at just the right time. So very quickly, I can browse this content from within the media library. I can make adjustments if I need to, and then I can publish it directly into the event. I can also use the tagging capability to queue this content up for uh, access later and add it to the event only whenever I'm ready. So let's see. Oh, I like the polar bear friction one. We'll add, we're going to tag that one so we get added to the smart screen. I tagged it with the color orange, and it'll be here available later. It's not published to the live event yet. But I can see it in the smart stream. I can come and filter it and find it very, very quickly. So that way, whenever I am ready to publish that particular piece of content, I can do that. But for the media library, I also have some additional options uh, around editing this image in place. In addition to updating the, copy, the caption or even turning it off altogether, I can also rotate the picture. So it's common in the case that whenever images are submitted via a mobile device, maybe they come in in the wrong orientation, or maybe they've been saved incorrectly in the wrong orientation, then very quickly I can see that content and then adjust it, rotate it, fix it, and then save and publish. Or tag to publish later. So this gives you a lot of flexibility to do things very quickly and efficiently from within the media library. And you also have a number of new options around finding that content. In addition to drilling down into all the individual types of content and finding things from within there, you also have the ability to select which users you want to pull that content from. So I want to see just the things that I uploaded, or if I want to see just the things that one of my colleagues uploaded, or the entire set of content that I can do that. Similarly, I can also filter it by how recent it is. So if I know that the content is only very new, then I can grab just those particular pieces. And if I want to see everything that has ever been added to the event library, I can do that as well. So this allows you to much better use the event library, the media library, as a way to have content persistent across your events that stays, so that way you can reuse it in the future um, or see what you've uploaded in the past. But whenever you're trying to find something very quickly, look at only the most recent content or only the things that you just uploaded lately that you know you need specifically for this event. The media library can also be accessed outside of the context of the event studio. If you're logged into your account and you're inside Cover It Live, you simply click on the Media Library page. And then similarly, you'll have access to all of the different content type folders, as well as the subfolders within those, and all of the content that's been added. You can add more content here in terms of preparing for your event before it's live. You can also make adjustments to existing content if you need to. And you can also manage the overall structure that you have in the media library. So this is a, a really great uh, best practice. When you know you have an event coming up and you know that you want to use media, you can come in and set up these things ahead of time. Upload some of the images that you know you want to use. Go ahead and set up links to YouTube. Or upload full videos that you know you want to add to the event or audio. And have these prepared. Especially if the case if, if there's a sponsorship or an advertisement. And you can set that up ahead of time and have that ready so that way you can publish it very, very quickly in the event and not have to do it, uh, not have to worry about that while you're actually in the process of running the event itself. As we'll see in a little bit, not only can you do this with images, photo, and text, but also for other interactive elements like polls and trivia. So you can come in and set up a poll ahead of time and have that ready to, again, very, very quickly run it whenever you're ready inside your event. And the same thing for trivia and other types of interactive elements that you can use, and interactive content that you can use during the course of the event. One more thing I'll note, whenever you're looking inside the media library, similar to the ability you have in the live event to upload media directly, you can also upload media to the event library while the event is live. 
In this case, the images will get added to the event, to the media library, and they'll be accessible there, but it does not put it in your event, and it's not queued up. It's simply added to the library, but while the event is live, and then you can make adjustments as needed and either publish it to the smart stream and queue it for later, or publish it directly live into the event. You can also see that any content that you've uploaded directly during the course of this event is accessible through the event uploaded files. So, whenever you have been adding content either through the drag and drop or through the event media upload that's, uh, that's a part of the writer's area, you can see all of that content and things that were added outside of, of your show preparation right here during the, uh, through the event uploaded files uh, folder. So hopefully from that you find some tips that maybe you didn't know about the media library, including the ability to drag and drop, or to search and find things more easily and filter down the, the type of options you have, or even to use it not just for photos and videos, but for other types of content that you want to set up ahead of the event as well. Now we'll jump into some of the other new features of the event studio for interactivity, including live scores. So for those that run sporting events, this is a great tool, particularly if it's covering professional sports, college sports, or even European uh, professional sports like European football and soccer, and, and provide you a way to have statistical data, scores, and even key information about the game automatically supplied inside your covered live event without you having to do additional work. It's great for your viewers because they can see what's happening, and you can focus your time on managing comments, pulling in Twitter content, or using rich content like video and photo to enhance the event in other ways. Even if, it's, even if you're covering something beyond uh, something that we have covered live through the live scores capability, our new manual scoreboards provide you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you display the score and the ability to make them look richer and more engaging with logos and customizable names and such. We'll jump back over into the event studio, and now I'll go into the scoreboard section. So when I click scoreboard from the toolbar, first you'll see that I have the, uh, some help here indicating what different types of scoreboards I can create, and I can choose my scoreboard type. Live scores are the simplest. So again, if you're covering some college professional sports in the U.S. or, or things such as European football and soccer, then this is going to be your best option because we have a, a partnership here that provides a lot of great data from a number of leagues around the world for, this, for these updates. So if I choose live scores, I can see a list of all the leagues that are currently active. And throughout the year, as some seasons start up or some other close down, you'll see these updated. And also within these, you'll see whenever there are special events, such as the Euro Championships or other types of sporting events that aren't year-round. Those will show up here within the leagues or within the particular sport that you pick. So for today's example, I'll go ahead and pick the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. Now from here, if you're covering this during the regular season, you probably want to choose by conference. So which teams do I want to cover? Where, what conference is my team in, and I can see all of those uh, scores from within that conference. I can set to the date that I want, um, whether it's in the future or whether I want to always cover the current day's games, and I can also pick a default team that I want to show as well. But you'll also notice that within men's basketball right now, there's the ability to pull in the NCAA Final Four feed, and this is a specific feed that's specialized for covering the NCAA men's tournament. Here I have the option to select which date that I want to cover. Which date of games during the tournament do I want to look at? I can see any of the dates that, uh, any of the dates that games are going to be held on in the future. Or I can simply pick most recent day's games, which will always adjust to the current date and show the next upcoming games. And then as the day changes, it will it'll shift over to the next day and show the current games from that day. Now I can also pick which team that I want to see. So I'm going to follow what's happening with Miami. And whenever you pick your team, this will be the default scoreboard that shows up inside of your live event. Whenever I publish this content, it will now show up for all of my users inside the live event, and you'll see the score there. As the game starts, the scores will automatically update. And we'll also provide additional information, uh, key information around fouls and last plays and things like that that have happened during the game. To see this from the user's standpoint, I'll jump over to my sample live event that's running. Get back and let's 
people in our demo event. And now I can see the scoreboard running down there. And you can see that the Miami Hurricanes, my default team, were picked and displayed first. But I can, as a user, I can click and see other games that are going on on the current day as well. So I can click around to those and see those. If I also don't want to see the scoreboard right now and I'm just interested in following the commentary on Twitter, then I can collapse that. So this also gives your users and your viewers a better experience as well because they can click in and see other things and other scores that maybe they're interested in and they want to engage in. Or if they're most interested in the chatter and the, the text content that's happening, they can follow that more closely and simply leave the scores minimized. You'll notice they still see a, a call across the bottom of the screen, and score updates will also appear there. So, this provides a really interactive experience, an easy way to keep following the game when actually taking work off of you for running the event and allowing you to focus, again, on comments, on Twitter, on social content, Instagram, whatever it may be that is going to enrich and entertain your audience. At any point, whenever you want to remove that scoreboard or change it, you can simply click to remove it. And the score will be removed from the live event right away. And you can add a different live score, or even if you want to add a manual score, you can do that as well. So as you can see now that I picked the NBA and I picked a date in the future, it will also show me which games are going to be on that specific game. So there's a lot of flexibility here and a lot of options for covering events as they happen and continually having updated scoreboards or from just doing it for a specific day for specific games and, and adding that to your event only as needed. But let's say you're not covering one of these particular types of leagues and you're doing something that you need to cover manually. Maybe it's high school sports, maybe it's a, a smaller league in which live scores aren't available, um, or maybe it's something just very, very unique, then you have the ability to use our, our new manual scoreboards. And you'll see here they come in several different formats. You can pick a format that either exactly corresponds to the type of game that you're following or something that may be the closest. So, for example, if I'm going to follow a, a high school basketball game, then I can add a basketball type scoreboard. And here you'll see I have the ability to upload my logo and put in my team names. So I'll put in a couple of high school names here. I can also add additional information, like their record. And I can also fill this information in by quarter. Or I can also, if I don't want to keep up that level of detail since it is manual, I can turn that off. And you'll only simply see the score as well as I can update the time and what period we're in with inside the game. Now, I also want to add logos for each of these teams because I want it to look nice, keep all that school spirit going. So I've customized the logos and added those as well. So now I've got a custom scoreboard going that I can update manually, publish the event, and even if I'm covering something that's not accessible through our live scores feature, I can very easily and quickly make a very professional, nice-looking scoreboard uh, that can follow that content. And to update it, all I have to do is click in, make the change, and publish. So even if you do have to keep track of, of a manual score, you can still do it much easier, much more quickly, and much more efficiently, and provide a really rich experience for your users who are engaging. This, one thing to note is that scoreboards aren't only great for sports, or as an obvious fit, but we've also had examples where scoreboards have come in handy for other types of events as well. For example, during the presidential election, we saw a number of news outlets actually use the scoreboard feature to keep track of the electoral votes being tallied and awarded to each of, uh, each of the, of the, uh, the candidates with inside the election. So there's a lot of other creative uses for scoreboards as well, and there's a lot of other formats here to experiment with. So any, any type of event that you may be covering where a scoreboard or even a sort of leaderboard or type style might be effective, then check out that capability from within the manual scores. 
and use it next time for your event. This would be a great way to keep your readers informed and there's a lot of flexibility in terms of the types of, of events and the types of scoring that you can do here. I'll even notice that you can do a leaderboard and add multiple users to that leaderboard, resource them as you go, and, and again, there's a lot that you can do. So check out the different types of manual scores and more live scores if it's applicable for you. The next area that we'll look at is polls and trivia. And users love to engage in simple ways. Not everybody wants to leave a comment, not everybody likes to tweet, but people like to click things. And so if you provide a poll as an opportunity for them to engage and give their feedback, then that's a great way that it's a thing that people like to participate in without overcommitting themselves. And trivia is the same way. Users like to get questions, answer questions, and think they know what's right. And it's, a, it's an excellent way to keep your users engaged throughout the event and, and actually encourage more interaction. So we'll look at how we can do that from the media library as well. Let's jump back over into our events and open back up the event studio. So from the toolbar, to access polls and trivia, simply click the polls and trivia button on the toolbar. And here you'll see very quickly, and similar to the media library, you have the ability to just have a pinch at a very, very quick poll question. I can publish that, and instantly it's in the event. So if I haven't set it up ahead of time, I can still very, very quickly from the event studio, create a poll, publish it, and how my readers engage. But similarly, if I've done a good job of preparing my event ahead of time, or I know that I've had certain polls I've created in the past that I want to reuse, I also have the opportunity to just very, very quickly pull that poll in as well. So I simply select it from the drop-down. This poll was created and is in the media library, and it shows up here under polls and trivia for me to select and instantly publish. So now I've got two polls running. Again, another very quick and easy way to get your users to engage and to allow them a way to, to provide feedback without having to, uh, to do it through comments or through Twitter or other things that they may not be as comfortable doing. Now, if I want to take it beyond polls and I actually want to use trivia, then I can open the trivia and gaming section. By clicking this link here, there's help information that talks about setting up trivia and gaming. And there's the ability to jump right in to trivia and add a new trivia question. You can also see any trivia questions that have already been created and that you've created maybe even through the media library or that you've even added right here um, directly in line while you're creating the event or while you're running the event. I already have one set up and it's just, it's already, uh, but it's not currently published and so I can simply click to publish it, save, and now if we look at our live event, we have a trivia option as well. What is Prince's favorite color? I believe the answer is purple. At that point, you have the opportunity to log in to play, and you can also award users points for getting that particular trivia question right. You can continue to manage trivia throughout the, the entire event. Users can respond and answer um, and, and decide what they believe the right answer is, and then once you're ready to tell everyone, you can indicate no more answers. And once that happens, everyone who has answered will find out whether or not they're right or wrong. You'll notice here that when the user logs in, you, you can provide them which options you want for them to connect. You can do all of these or um, only select a subset, and depending upon which one you prefer and which, for example, social logins or even custom logins that you use, then you can, you can select those in the event setup. So I'm going to log in. I'm going to vote. Great. I got the correct answer. So now I feel pretty cool, and now I'm ready to close out the trivia question. Or allow any more answers, and I will win because I got the most points. One thing you'll also notice as we've added scoreboards and as we've added polls and trivia to the viewer experience, that they have the ability, those will rotate through um, in the information center area, but they also have the ability to click and select which ones they want to see at any particular time or pick a specific one off of the scroll 
and focus on just that one to either answer or see the results. So again, your viewers and your audience have much more flexibility in terms of controlling what type of content, what pieces they want to engage with, or what they want to focus on while they're watching the full event. If at any point I want to remove any of these polls or any of these items, then I can simply unpublish them. And if I want to end them and make the results final, then I can do that as well. Do you want to be careful because that can't be undone, but it will close out the poll and the results will be final. So this is, again, polls and trivia are a great way to engage users. They love to participate, and it's also a way to reward them for, for engaging in your event and can be very quickly and easily set up with the event studio either on the fly or ahead of time whenever you're getting your event prepared and ready. The last area we'll look at is the news flash. And similar to what we've, we've seen with scoreboards, um, with trivia and polls, even with media, news flash is very easy to set up and you can have them set up ahead of time and then just ready to publish during the event, or you can set them up on the fly whenever you're ready. You can also have multiple news flashes running that will rotate throughout the event, and again, your, your viewers will have the opportunity to select whether, which ones they want to look at and make sure that they can read the entire news flash before moving on to something else. So to access the news flashes, I simply click the news flash button from within the toolbar. I'm actually going to jump over here to our ticker event. Now you'll notice I have a number of news flashes already set up. And at any point with all of these that are already um, set up, I can just in simply indicate that I want to publish them, and now they're added to the event. So again, a very great, flexible way and I encourage you to have those prepared inside the media library ahead of time so that way it's something that you uh, can do very, very quickly during the event and don't have to focus on it. But things do happen, particularly if you're covering breaking news, and you might need to make a change very, very quickly. In that case, I can simply add a news flash very, very quickly on the fly. Everyone else can spell better than I can. Simply create your news flash, and now it's available. Immediately live in your event, all of your viewers can see that. And once they've seen it, they can click to collapse it, or go back to playing the, the trivia and polls, or even the scoreboard, whatever they prefer. And again, if that update changes, or if I need to add additional ones, then I can do that. Or I can simply remove it from being published, and it's now gone from the event. If you'll notice with some of these examples, these are also great ways for you to have advertising inside of your event. So if you want to create a news flash that has particularly maybe a sponsor logo or an image and has a link for users to click, then you can do that. And that's a, one of several monetization opportunities that we've talked about in previous Summit Live University sessions that enables you one more unique way to monetize your event. The news flash allows you to have that persistent sort of image or content there and even something that can be clickable by simply adding HTML, some very simple HTML into the event, as is the example here. So, news flashes again are very useful for either communicating information that's pertinent and you want to remain accessible during the course of the event or for even using as a monetization option. And one of the key things to note is, that regardless of the type of event that you're running, whether it's news-oriented, sports-oriented, um, or anything else, you can also combine these. We saw a number of cases of, during the State of the Union address, we had news coverage sites who were following along with what the President was saying and, and what, um, what the speech was, was being delivered and providing commentary. At the same time, they still ran a scoreboard because people were interested in what the Miami Heat game was doing. So, Combining these also provides a very interactive and fun experience and actually gives your, your audience exactly what they're looking for and the ability to tailor the experience towards what they're most interested in following. And if they want to follow the basketball game while also following the State of the Union address, you provide the perfect solution for them. So today, that covers all of the tips and tricks that we were looking to show you around using the media library, around live scores, polls and trivia, and news flashes. Hopefully you've seen some of the new shortcuts that enable these to be done quickly and efficiently inside the event studio, as well as them reminded about the capability of the media library as a great tool for setting up your event content beforehand, so that way you have less to do while the event is actually running and can focus on your audience. 
Additionally, there, there's always more functionality and new improved features being added to each of these areas, and we'll continue to cover those in upcoming Harvard Live University events. And we want to take this one opportunity to remind you about one other feature that we also had a CILU session on several months back, but that's our channel page capability, which essentially gives you the opportunity to have your events indexed and accessible through search engines, uh, to search engines such as Google and Bing and Yahoo, and, and all of that content delivered up um, through a server side hosted on our system, but through a, a site and a page that is completely white label and matches the look and feel of your site. And you can have multiple channel pages set up, and there's a great deal of other functionality and flexibility that's coming around how you can display and lay out events uniquely with inside of channel pages that give you more advantages over the traditional embed. Um, but also, in addition to just a, a, an ability to give you enhanced SEO, Channel pages also provide a home for your events, a great way to archive them and make them accessible in the future for people who want to find them. Um, and they're also uh, compatible with our syndication methods that include embedding it on multiple sites, uh, the traditional embed on multiple sites or Facebook or other ways uh, that you can publish your event, including cover pages. So if you're interested in channel pages or would like to learn more, please email us. They're available to custom subscription customers, and if you're on a self-serve plan, they can be set up for an additional cost, and we can cover that with you. So if you'd like more information on that, um, or, or just want to have uh, a chat around what some of that functionality is and, and more detail around exactly how you would use it, we'd be glad to have that conversation. Just let us know. So at this point, again, thank you for joining. If you have any questions, um, I'll turn it over to Spencer to see if there's any that will be helpful for me to answer for the entire group. And I'll take that quick opportunity to remind you of our next Covered Live University session, which will be on Thursday, April 25th at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And we'll provide you some updates soon on some of the topics that we'll be covering for that. And if you have any input into that, we would love to hear it. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I wanted to remind you, you can access the chat window to submit your questions. At the top of the screen, if you click on the green drop-down and click on chat, you can submit your questions there, and we will answer those. We do have a few so far, um, so I'm going to start with those. We had a question from Dave earlier, and he was wanting to know about the possibility of customizing the location of the scoreboard. I know now it's at the bottom of, of the window, but I uh, was hoping that maybe you can move to the top or somewhere else. No, that's a great question. So currently, um, in the viewer experience and in the viewer window, where the scoreboard shows up is in the information center where news flashes, poll trivia, and all of those are localized in that one spot. Currently, that cannot be moved. However, we have some enhancements coming in the future where you'll have the ability to move that up to the top or to lay it out in a totally different area of the page and even separate it out from the rest of the live content. So there's a lot of flexibility coming down the road very soon that you'll see, and we'll be covering that in some of the upcoming sessions. But currently, it is fixed there, um, but that will be changing. That will be an option that you will have for too long. Uh, also, for those of you who may be a little more developer-oriented or have teams that might be interested in making a more customized experience, you can access uh, content from, from the event, uh, including polls and things like that from the API as well, and also display that separately on the page if you like. But keep in mind, one, one possibility uh, on top of that, though, is the ability to set up two events. So, if, for example, you wanted to just have the scoreboard running in one place, you could set up that and, and have the scoreboard on one part of the page and then have a second event for maybe Twitter content or your commentary um, on the page as well. So there's a few different options that you can do today, but the crux of your question about being able to customize that location, that capability is coming very soon. All right, we have a, another question here. Um, and this one kind of follows up with uh, what you were just talking about with channel pages. I don't know... Uh, Maybe you could work on this uh, for our follow-up question, but someone wanted to see an example of the channel page in action. Um, so uh, I'll let you think about that for a second and go with a question from Herb here. He wanted to know what other sports uh, we're looking into adding to our, our scoreboard functionality. Oh, that's a great, uh, great question. And the partnership that we have worked out to provide a lot of live uh, scoring data is something that's constantly evolving and building, and we're always looking to add additional coverage of sports. And so some of the things, for example, that we're currently looking at is covering golf tournaments and some of the, and the majors that happen there, as well as majors for some of the other um, uh, significant sports. So uh, golf is the most immediate next one that we're currently looking at, and we're looking to make sure that we have adequate data and that we can provide it in a, um, a real-time context that's good enough that, that makes sense for a live scoring opportunity. So that's the most 
immediate one on the radar, and we're going to continue to evolve that and add other sports. You will see that whenever a football season kicks back in the fall, there will be college and, and professional football covered as well. Um, and we'll continue to add on to those leagues. And as we have requests um, that for certain leagues that are very popular, we'll also look to see what we can do to add those as well. Um, and our next question comes to us from Ann Jeanette. She's wanting to know if there, if there were any, any work in progress on the Cover It Live app. Uh, specifically uh, push updates or, or other updates around the Cover It Live app for producing events? Um, that's also a very good question. And, in fact, some updates have recently been released, as hopefully you received from the email um, a few weeks back. There was a number of updates to Twitter, and, and, and we sent an email indicating that you do now need to authenticate with Twitter in order to maintain Twitter functionality and to have Twitter... Um, uh, content being able to use inside your event, you do need to authenticate and log into that foreign event. With that change, which was introduced when the event studio was launched and has also uh, been added to the classic console, we also added that capability um, into the native apps for Android and iOS as well, and took that as an opportunity to make some additional updates um, to those apps and some improvements there. So uh, there have been apps, uh, there are updates that are being made to that, and there are, there are more coming. We haven't specifically heard the request for push updates, and we'd definitely like more information, and maybe we'll follow up individually around some of the um, examples or use cases that you have there, uh, because we'd like to understand that and definitely be able to consider adding that into the app. But there are some improvements that have already happened, and additionally more coming for the app. And it should also be noted that the new event studio has been optimized to work in a tablet experience. So if you were to use it on an iPod, for example, um, or, or another um, Wi-Fi or, or bandwidth-enabled um, tablet, the interface that the event studio uses um, has been optimized to fit with inside that tablet screen. You can also do swiping to drag and drop content between the different windows inside the event studio, and scrolling and all of those sort of things with one finger are all um, capabilities that exist for the event studio, so it has been designed to be optimized for mobile. Uh, both in terms of form factor and how you interact with the different elements inside the page. So, in that case, you don't even have to get an app. You can just log in to the current live website and use the event studio to run your event in a much more uh, convenient way from your tablet device um, as well. And to follow up real quick, Spencer, uh, while I was talking and trying to multicast, I pulled up uh, one quick example out of the channel page here for the Washington Examiner, and you can see their State of the Union coverage. It's still, this is a replay event, so you'll see the interactive elements now. Um, but you can see the content is delivered into the page, and this content is all SEO accessible as it's hosted within the page. There's also links to older content as well as to other events. And, um, and it, yet it still looks in a very familiar format that your, your viewer and your, your viewers and your audience members will be familiar with with Cover Live. Um, but as I was talking about earlier, with enhancements coming that will allow you more flexibility on the location of different pieces within inside the Cover Live window, Channel pages also have a great deal of flexibility coming in terms of how you can lay out and display these events and make them look very different than the traditional cover live experience. And we'll, we'll cover that in some of the upcoming um, sessions. And, and just to add on what Ben said there on that, that last example from the Washington Examiner, there, there's no right rail content, but that's absolutely something you can add there um, to make that page match the look and feel of everything else on your site. We have a couple questions now from our friend Chad Schlegel. Uh, first question is about uh, uploading YouTube clips. Uh, in the past, they kind of uploaded in different ways. Now in the event studio, they upload. Uh, can you talk about how the YouTube clips display? And then I'll follow up with this second question also related to video. Sure thing. So there's a couple of different things to note around YouTube. Um, the first is if you know, for example, uh, if, if you're searching for a YouTube video that you want to add in the event, you can do that from the search page. So you don't have to have the, the embed already queued up, but you can go search for the event or search for uh, the, the video content from within the search page in YouTube. And you've got the search uh, options here as well as the ability to restrict it by time so that you can see only the most recent things. And then from within the event studio, you can preview the clip and see the actual YouTube clip here. Or, um, and like the kind of all the other types of content, you can publish it directly into the event or you can tag it for queued use later. So this gives you the opportunity to search, find content, add it, or tag it, so that way you can publish it later whenever you're ready. 
So that's one means by which you can add YouTube content. I mean, I just simply go search and find it and then add it to the event. Using the event studio, uh, using the media library within the event studio, if you have your own clips that you already know that you want, um, you can do those as well, and you can have those actually set up before the event is, is even run underneath uh, videos. You can have YouTube essentially embeds ready to go, so that way it's not the full video and it doesn't require the upload time, it's the embed. It's going to embed directly from YouTube and display that within the event. And these are actually a few examples right here. So our little cover live video, which comes in from YouTube. So I've added these to the media library ahead of time and have it ready so that way I can simply find it and publish it very quickly directly into the event. And those are simple YouTube embeds. It's not the full video uh, file itself. It's very, very quick to do to set up. And if I jump back over to the media library, and I indicate that I want to add a video, you can, you can see right here the ability to do that. So, um, for example, I can put the embed uh, code from YouTube right here inside uh, in, inside my setup for the video, or if it's a file that I'm going to upload, I can do that too. But whenever I'm uploading it, I'm essentially uploading the raw video file directly, and it's going to get compressed and then be able to display through whatever means is available to the viewer. So if it's a QuickTime movie or a Windows Media file or whatever it may be, then I can browse and upload that, and then that will be delivered into the uh, viewer window, but it will depend upon the, use, the user's players on how that displays and how that plays. One other thing that's uh, related to how you can use YouTube as one example um, is the new RSS capability as well. So within the search, we've added, with the event studio, we've added the ability for you to add RSS feeds. And generally, most people are using this for article or blog content. But one thing to keep in mind is if you have a YouTube channel, there's an RSS feed of that YouTube channel, similarly for our Tumblr pages and other things like that. You can add those RSS feeds right here, and then that content will show up here, and then you can just quickly add it directly from this RSS tab at any point. And we also have additional enhancements coming to this feature um, in the very near future with your ability to save these RSS feeds and use them across multiple events at once. So hope that answers the question. There's a few different ways, whether you want to set it up ahead of time, whether you want to add it very, very quickly um, in, you know, in flow or on the fly during the course of the event, or whether you have access to specific feeds that already have that YouTube content ready. There's a number of different ways in which you can do it very, very quickly. All right, our next question comes to us from Mike Coon. He had a question regarding the live scoreboards. Um, this question was, what's the licensing agreement with the scoreboard functionality? If you're a reporter covering a game, can you access the scoreboard function even if the live event is licensed by uh, someone else? And I don't know if he's referring to the the television rights or if he's referring to some other sorts of rights, but uh, maybe you could just explain yeah. our, our, our partnership and how the live data comes in. Sure thing. So what we've done is we've partnered um, with a company called Sports Data to provide uh, the, the live feeds to you. And they focus on generating the content, getting the stats, and providing those in a format that we can consume and distribute to live events. The way that Live Sports currently works is if you're licensed to use Cover It Live, you go through a self-serve subscription or a custom subscription, then we've made this functionality available to you as a subset of licensing Cover It Live. So if you are a, um, a, a paid or even in a trial plan user or a custom user within an account that's paying for Cover It Live, then you have access to this functionality and, and are covered um, by the rights for use of that within Cover It Live. Now, beyond that, uh, I'm not sure if there's an example beyond that that you're looking to speak to, and maybe that would be something we can follow up on more detail one-on-one, -on -one, uh, because we definitely would like to know if that's not exactly what you meant. But in terms of using Cover Live, you have full access to that scoreboard functionality and to the stats and things that are distributed through the Cover Live system through that partnership. Um, using it outside of the context of Cover Live isn't covered, uh, and you have to look in, for, in terms of any other relationships you have for scoring the data outside of, of using it in conjunction with Cover It Live. But certainly if you're running a live event covering the, the game um, or following along multiple games or as the action happens, then you have access to this data um, and through your Cover It Live license. All right, we have uh, one final question here. It comes to us from John. His question is about is wondering if Cover It Live provides a live video streaming function. That's a good question and something that comes up frequently. And currently, we do not. We have focused on social um, text content and rich media that can be embedded inside of your live events. 
Um, most cases, what we've learned through most of our customers is that whenever their audience is following along for a covered live event, one of a few things is either true. Either one, they're following at work and they're not as likely to consume non-stop live video. Um, or number two, they're doing it in conjunction with following along a, a game or an event or something that's happening at home on television and sort of a second screen experience. So they're already consuming video primarily through that, and really what they're using cover live for is to engage in a conversation um, and find other cool content that's interesting. So that's what we have kept focus on with regard to the platform and what we'll, what we'll continue to build our features around. Now, that being said, many of our customers also have uh, whether it's a, a live video stream or whether it's um, a direct video broadcast that they have and they wanted to pair with the cover live of this. Many of them have done that through a number of other services that are available or through their systems that they, they have or partnerships that they've done um, to add that video. They simply pair that live video on the page and then run the cover live event right next to it. Um, and in the past, we did have some partnership with some services that did that sort of capability, um, but we found it not to work very well. And, and a lot of those... Uh, um, Companies aren't necessarily around anymore to provide that capability. And we found that our partners and our customers normally have access to that through other means uh, in, in a much more efficient and much more robust way that's tailored to the type of video content they're trying to provide, whether it's a live broadcast or simply whether it's uh, you know one-on-one -on -one individual chat. Um, and, and so like it's really up to you to be able to add that where it makes sense. But with most events, users are engaging around the text and maybe short video clips or photo content, but not necessarily live video content because they can find that in other places. But we'll always be, we're always looking to, to continue to see how things evolve, how the nature of live events continue to, to continue to change, and so it's certainly something we continue to watch very closely um, and always keep very strong consideration of and, and always want feedback and your thoughts around. No one has any further questions. We have just a, a few seconds if anyone has further questions. If not, that will wrap up the question and answer portion of today's Cover It Live University. Also, feel free if you have any questions to follow up afterwards. Um, you can always contact us at support at coveritlive.com or you can respond to the email with the login information that you received for this Cover It Live University session, and we will respond to you as quickly as possible. Our next Cover It Live University session, as Ben mentioned earlier, is Thursday, April 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, stay tuned to CoverItLive.com and the Cover It Live University tab, as well as our social media sites for information and topics for that session. Again, we appreciate you using Cover It Live and I greatly appreciate you joining us today at Cover It Live University. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Thank you.